So let me begin with some introductions. Our first two speakers, Professor Caron Beaton-Wells and Professor Paul Genton. Caron has been at Melbourne Business School since 2020, uh, right from the first um, moment as Dean Internal at MBS, she demonstrated incredible interest in diversity and inclusion for women leaders. Caron was formerly a professor of competition law at Melbourne Business School. And as Dean Internal, she has full responsibility and leads the senior team uh, on all of the functions of the school, students, programs, uh, people, uh, culture, and etc. So fantastic to have Caron offer her reflections today. Professor Paul Jensen is Deputy Dean at the Faculty of Business and Economics. And Paul similarly has had extensive experience um, overseeing leading programs, particularly the BCom, and has a lot of wisdom in that space that he's gonna share with us today, I hope. Paul's particular interest is in innovation and technology. But I want to also point out that he's been a remarkable advocate for Indigenous business leadership. He's been a remarkable supporter of our joint efforts to uh, create uh, much more of a focus on Indigenous business leadership, uh, including setting up, helping to set up the Dylan Dua Centre for Indigenous Business Leadership. So over to you two. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Amanda. Um, and I am just delighted to be here with uh, esteemed colleagues, but also with our students, alumni, staff, clients, and others to mark this day on which we very much celebrate the achievements of women across the world in many, many different contexts and sectors and their achievements despite political, cultural, and socioeconomic barriers including we are here to celebrate the great strides made towards a more gender equal world. We take time out on this day in a conscious and deliberate way, not just to imagine, but to advocate for and commit to taking action towards such a world, a world free of bias, stereotypes and discrimination, a world that is more equitable and inclusive. Diversity and equity have always been very con personal concerns to me, having been born and raised in apartheid South Africa and having migrated to multicultural Australia where so many <clears throat> of our freedoms and rights are so often taken for granted. Yet still, uh, to be acknowledged, a country that has a long way to go, as I discovered as a young female barrister, having my baptism of fire at the bar as junior counsel acting on the Commonwealth side for the Stolen Generations case now many years ago. So I um, want to share some slides with you and uh, step through some preliminary comments um, about this day and what it means to us at Melbourne Business School. Uh, together with Paul, I'm really excited to share with you the priority that we are giving in a shared joint initiative towards enhanced gender balance and equity amongst our academics. And then uh, Paul's going to share with you um, some of the challenges we continue to face and the action that we're taking to promote greater diversity and inclusion amongst our students. Recognizing that we as business schools are a funnel for future leaders, that we are strategically positioned to bring lasting change to the global corporate environment. And we train students as change agents to enter that environment, providing employers with the widest possible skills <clears throat> and thoughts, but also setting them up to rise through organizations to themselves set the agenda for greater diversity and inclusion. Let me first set the scene now about some recent data that does show progress made in both of these areas, but still very much a long way to go globally amongst business schools. The data you see on that slide there is from a study released earlier this year from the Cambridge Judge Business School. Unfortunately, as far as I'm aware, there's not at least a recent similar study done on Australian business schools, but anecdotally, I'd be surprised if the data was very different. This is a study that's drawn on Financial Times reporting data from 11 top ranked US and UK business schools, comparing them with the rest of the schools in those two countries. 
And if you look from the left to the right, you'll see over a time frame of 2014 to 2020, the average female percentage representation on the board, on the faculty and on the, in the student body. The blue denoting the UK, the red denoting the US and the gray, all other schools in those countries. And really, um, the story is a fairly self-evident one. There has been movement and in the right direction, but we still have a very long way to go to reach gender parity uh, across these domains. And what I show here, of course, is just about the numbers, about representation. It doesn't speak to how the women represented in those numbers actually experience life in business school as an academic or a student. It doesn't speak necessarily to career progression, pay equity or social interaction and inclusion. But in terms of career progression, um, the story is equally not, um, a, a, not a positive one overall. We see there on the right hand side of this slide showing data collected by the American Accreditation Agency, AACSB, a narrowing funnel uh, as academics start their careers in the lowest ranks and move towards the highest rank of professor. We appreciate, uh, as again shown on this slide in the orange box and on the left hand side, that this has real implications for the representation of women in senior administrative leadership positions, such that at least in 2018 across the world, only one quarter of deans, one third of associate deans, and slightly more than one fifth of department chairs were women. So let me turn now to the joint MBSL FBE strategy for, in, for fixing this, for, for tackling these issues. Noting we've made a very deliberate decision to tackle both the numbers, the representation issue, and the equity issues. Recognizing that as we do, um, gender equity is about fairness, it's about justice in the distribution of opportunities, resources, and responsibilities across gender groups. So it's far more than a commercial consideration or, or strategic enabler, it's, it reflects a moral imperative to provide a safe and fair and enriching environment for our staff. Thinking about our ambitions, um, we did appreciate that the starting point um, is really that we better understand the obstacles and the challenges currently facing women in academia and in our organizations especially. And that then we move to actively recruit, develop, support and promote more women to ensure we have a workplace in which women are welcomed and valued, rewarded, respected and supported. And that in doing so, we live up to our core values of a non-discriminatory and inclusive work environment. If we are to be true to fulfilling those ambitions, then we need to be working across various domains, looking at recruitment and selection, support and development, career progression, and indeed leadership. So in our strategy, we set out what we see as the challenges in each of these areas and then set for ourselves some um, commitments to, to tackle those challenges. In the area of recruitment and selection, recognizing that unconscious bias is often a factor that contributes to continued discrimination against qualified and capable women. Uh, we need to be concerted in the way in which we revise, review, um, and really improve our selection and recruitment processes. But it starts with increasing awareness uh, of the fact uh, that we offer real career opportunities and an enriching uh, work experience for female applicants in, in management speak, improving our employee value proposition that we then increase the number of female candidates for positions and opportunities available and the proportion of those who are successful. We understand, of course, that it's not enough to recruit more women academics. We then need to support and actively develop them across their careers. Again, understanding the challenges and obstacles that they might face and what aspects of it in our culture in an academic environment might hold them back. We need to ensure that all of our colleagues of every gender actively do this, that they actively support and champion their female colleagues to further their careers. 
In terms of formal career progression, we need to understand that um, seeking promotion often arises at a time when it is not um, the easiest for women who are also starting a family to take on a greater workload, to take on those extra service requirements that might make them stand out uh, from their male colleagues. We understand that often there is a lack of clarity for women uh, and indeed for others about the promotion process. And they need to be um, not only helped to understand what's involved in that process, but actively encouraged to apply. Um, in promotion processes, there needs to be assessment of performance relative to opportunity, taking into account the particular circumstances of women who are often also caregivers. And in the area of leadership, um, again, understanding or taking as a starting point an understanding of the challenges and obstacles women face, including, as I've mentioned, unconscious bias that operates in this area as well, the lack of formality that sometimes attends internal recruitment and promotion to senior leadership ranks, and the expectations of what comes with the leadership role and what that will mean for women who carry competing responsibilities. We need to be um, creating and demonstrating the development opportunities and career paths available for our women towards senior leadership roles. Again, looking to ensure we are meeting best practice in our senior leadership appointment processes and ensuring that there is gender balance on all of those other committees and groups and fora where women have a chance to demonstrate their leadership credentials. So lastly, drawing, um, as you might expect I would, on some of the business school literature, we do appreciate that having a good strategy is one thing, but it is only as good as its execution. So sitting behind these commitments are comprehensive action plans with accountabilities and timelines to ensure these commitments are met, as well as a commitment to ensuring that we track and we report openly on our progress against these commitments. Ultimately, also, we appreciate that not just having good policies and procedures are enough, that it is ultimately a cultural shift that will be required, a shift in, to be honest, what are some entrenched norms, conscious and unconscious in our organizations that can work against gender balance and equity. And finally, and I do appreciate the irony on drawing from Winston Churchill, um, I'd exhort my colleagues um, and all others who champion this area, just never to give up on, on this. There has been progress made. Um, we need not to forget that in looking ahead at all of the work still to be done. Mm -hmm. And we need just to keep at it. Let me hand over then to you, Paul. Thank you, Karan, and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, an inspirational talk, Karan, thank you so much. And can I just start off by saying what a pleasure it has been to work with you um, over the last couple of years uh, on this and on many other issues. Um, it, you have brought a lot of care and compassion and genuine leadership to the space, and it's an absolute delight to, to work with you. Can I just also start by acknowledging country, uh, acknowledging that I live and work on Wurundjeri country, um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be on this beautiful country and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I also pay my respects, as Amanda noted up front, to Indigenous women um, who have got an amazing set of skills and capabilities that we can do a lot to learn from. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that we do have um, Indigenous women in our faculty and in our business school, and it's a pleasure and a delight to be able to work with them and learn from them as well. Um, I'm constantly trying to improve my leadership and management style, and I get inspiration from outstanding uh, women in, in those positions. So I was going to take a slightly different tack today uh, and look at student issues and, and really try and focus in, hone in on some, some issues that aren't going well for us. Um, and I think Karan has really set the scene beautifully and showed that there is some movement. It is slow, but it's in the right direction. And, and I wanted to flip that on its head and, and give you some, some background information and some data, some striking data that um, is moving in the wrong direction. 
and that relates to female participation rates in our flagship undergraduate degree, the Bachelor of Commerce. So I've been BCom program director for the past five years, uh, and over the course of that five-year period, we have been a steady. We have seen a steady uh, reduction in participation rates of females in the domestic market. So, in other words, our own local high school students. Um, typically, in the past, we used to have about a, um, a, a 60-40 split between men and women, and that has been inching away uh, in the wrong direction over at least the last five years. And it's something that's very alarming to me because I think there's a sense in which we absolutely need to be doing all that hard work that Karan just talked about within our own institution now. But we have to be mindful of the fact that there's a pipeline of, of amazing female talent that is thinning. I won't say drying up, but it is absolutely thinning. And if we don't fix that, then all of the hard work that Karan has been talking about um, will go to nothing because it'll be a much smaller base from which we're trying to uh, appeal and, and nurture um, female talent. So I am very concerned about it. Uh, and I have been looking hard uh, with the team to look at things we can do to try and improve it. So we're asking ourselves the very, very tough and difficult question, what is unappealing to women about the Bachelor of Commerce? And if we can't answer that question, then I don't think we'll be able to, to, to redress the imbalance. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of barriers, structural barriers, and a lot of biases that go into, you know, the selection and recruitment of people into our degrees. Uh, and we need to unpick that if we're going to do a good job at trying to, to trying to address it. So I just wanted to mention a couple of things we're working on to, to address that. The first is um, that we have made an application through the Academic Board for the Special Equity Access Scheme, uh, which will enable um, uh, women to be able to tick a box in their, in their VTAC selection process, which will signify that they're in an underrepresented group in the Bachelor of Commerce. And we're hoping once that is approved and once that's communicated uh, through the school system, that in the next couple of years, we'll see a, a major step up in terms of the attractiveness um, of the pathways into the, into the BCom. Now, of course, that's only one thing we need to do. That can't possibly solve the problem and can't possibly answer that question about what is unappealing about the Bachelor of Commerce as it currently stands. And we are doing some really tough work to look at the curriculum. Uh, we know that there are a lot of women that would love to become business leaders, but they look at the space and think, oh, I'm not sure that they've got the ethical values I'm, I believe in. I'm not sure that it's well aligned with, with my own values and principles. And we need to do a better job at, at um, building curriculum that actually um, it celebrates all the fantastic work that's been done on things like um, modern slavery and ethical leadership in the business world. We need to see more women come through and embrace that and become a beacon, a lighthouse for others. Uh, and so we are looking at ways in which we can, we can do that. We are also shining a light on the student clubs and societies. So for some women, they look at some of the behavioural norms uh, and the cultural norms in clubs and societies, uh, not all of them, but in some of them, and say, you know what, that's a very blokey and boozy environment that I just don't feel welcome and safe in. Uh, and we need to change that. Um, if we're serious about, as an institution, about upholding those, those values of respect and inclusiveness, uh, then we need to, that needs to manifest itself across all of our um, aspects of um, student support, including the clubs and societies. Uh, and so I am now working with our team to look at protocols and policies and, and enforceable protocols and policies that we can then implement to make sure that our clubs and societies understand what we mean by inclusiveness and how they can play a, a more prominent role in helping us achieve our diversity and inclusion goals and objectives. Um, we're doing lots of other things. And one final thing that I just wanted to mention was that we are well aware that uh, other areas, particularly in STEM, have been very successful in talking to high school female students uh, and, and um, consulting with them about what it is that might be attractive for them in a STEM career. 
and they have run a series of camps over the, over the wintertime, um, which have been very successful in terms of building a pipeline, building that kind of scaffolded pathway from high school into engineering and IT degrees, for example. Uh, and we've done nothing like that. We've, we've been really careless in the way we've thought about um, building uh, pipelines for, for female students, high school students, into the degree. Um, and we're going to try and address that. So we have now got in principle approval from the faculty executive to, to start a camp um, that would be uh, run uh, every winter, like the Girl Power and Engineering and IT camp. And we'll, we'll mimic some of those um, aspects of, of, that, of that particular camp um, and refresh and rejuvenate where appropriate because uh, that is now five or six years old. Uh, but we see that as an important beachhead for us in terms of signalling to high school students um, that we deeply care about diversity, we deeply care about um, their participation and that we want to go out of our way to make sure that they understand there is a pathway to a, to a wonderful um, undergraduate and, and potentially postgraduate career and successful business career. So that's just a flavour of the sorts of things we are doing. Uh, as Kron mentioned, it is tough and challenging work, but, but I am absolutely committed to delivering on this. Um, I've just signed a new five-year contract as Deputy Dean, and this is at the top of my list of priorities. And I'm working very closely with our new Joint Assistant um, Dean in Diversity and Inclusion to make sure that we deliver on this. They're big ambitions, but this is work that absolutely must be done. Okay, with that, I am going to hand back to Amanda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul and Karan. Some amazing challenges and wisdom in there. But I really felt uh, that you pulled out the, the ethics around these issues. Um, you know, they're not just commercial issues. They have deep ethical roots. Some of the uh, experiences that young women students are experiencing we do would not wish on anyone. So I'm going to uh, encourage you to use the Q&A box, encourage the audience, pop your questions in the Q&A box. But I'm also going to invite Danielle to put up a poll right now, which asks you what is the biggest barrier in your experience uh, to reducing bias. So you'll see that poll on the screen. So if you wouldn't mind just... Um, responding. I know it's probably hard to choose one or two of those, but please do choose one and give us a sense of what you think are the most important issues, uh, barriers that are getting in the way of us acting on bias. And if you've got an extra moment, please do put a question in the Q&A box too, or upvote a question that is already there. So I'll just give a couple more seconds. So a lot of those um, are coming in. You know, we've got a lot of um, consistency across a number of factors. Perhaps I'll ask Danielle to close the poll and then uh, that will be revealed. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of support for a number of things, lack of awareness of bias and its negative impacts. Uh, absence of a psychologically safe environment to call out bias. And, and you know, Paul's, uh, some of Paul's experience and stories are obviously part of that. Not walking the talk, um, having policies, but not enough follow through uh, to action. And historic structures, norms and practices, we heard about that from uh, both of our speakers, some of those norms which feel very blokey. So uh, I'm going to now introduce and turn to our two remaining speakers, um, Professor Andrew John and Professor Isabel Metz. And Andrew and Isabel are going to start to help us address some of these questions. Firstly, Professor Andrew John is a professor of economics at the Melbourne Business School. Andrew is also uh, Associate Dean of Faculty at the Business School and so has carriage of a lot of this work uh, in introducing colleagues, academic colleagues, to issues of diversity and in fostering greater inclusion and less bias uh, among the faculty. Andrew's had a lot of experience working in Southeast Asia and Europe, and I'm sure that that consulting experience and that academic experience has really nurtured and given him a, 
uh, a base from which uh, a passion around diversity is, has, has arisen. I'll also introduce Professor Isabel Metz, who's Professor of Organisational Behaviour at the Melbourne Business School. Isabel is an internationally renowned expert in this field of bias, so it's appropriate that we uh, really do uh, finish our presentations, at least with Isabel. We're very lucky to have Isabel. She's been internationally recognised and awarded for her work in the space of, of combating gender bias. And uh, Isabel teaches on our Managing Diversity and Managing People program. So thank you, Andrew, over to you first. Thank you so much, Amanda, and good morning, everybody. On the 4th of August, 20, uh, 1916, a young Scotswoman called Jean McGilvery Hare turned 21. And in recognition, her father gave Jean her very own key to the front door to their house. And of course there were rules, in particular to do with what time she had to be home in the evenings. And these were rules that she immediately broke. The day after her birthday, she stayed out too late because she had attended a suffragette meeting. When she came home, she used her new key to unlock the door. She entered the house to find her father standing waiting for her in the hallway. And he held out his hand, and without a word, she placed the key in his hand. The technical term for that is patriarchy. Now, Jean was my grandmother, and I, I begin with her because one of the things Amanda asked me to do today was to, was to tell my personal story, which I guess means to explain what has brought me to the place I am today as someone in a leadership position at Melbourne Business School, trying to do my own small part to address bias and to improve the school as a place for women to work and a place for women to study. And as I'm speaking of place, before I go any further with the story of how I reached my current intellectual place, I do want to note that the physical place where I am currently standing is on unceded Wurundjeri land. And I acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Now, I'm about to show you something called an engram. And for those of you who haven't seen one of these before, this shows the relative usage, the frequency of usage of different words in published books. It comes from the Google Books corpus, which uh, is a massive, massive corpus of, of published works. And this particular Engram, uh, as, as you can tell, is, is kind of in tribute to my first wave feminist grandmother. And it shows, as you would expect, that in the early years of the 20th century, there was this big uh, spike in the usage of the term suffragette. And I'm going to be showing you a few of these engrams over the next few minutes. Don't worry, by the way, about the vertical scale. That's going to change from graph to graph. I just want you kind of to focus on the trends. And before I get into kind of showing you more of these, I do have to acknowledge that this is a personal narrative that I'm telling, which means it's colored by all of the biases that stem from my own background and circumstances, not just being male, but also white, straight, cisgendered, educated, having grown up middle class in relatively wealthy countries and so on. The technical term for that, by the way, is privilege. Now, jumping ahead a generation from my grandmother, I have this engram for the women of my parents' generation. And the, the decade I've highlighted there is actually the decade when my parents were in their 20s. And that was the period which, at least on the basis of linguistic usage, we might want to call peak housewife. But by the time I was born, the term was very definitely in decline. And when I went to university and then to graduate school, the notion, frankly, felt very outdated. People weren't talking about housewives anymore. Um, the women I studied with certainly weren't planning to be housewives. They were getting degrees and they were going to work at top consulting firms and law firms. The women I went to graduate school with were getting PhDs and being hired to prestigious academic jobs at MIT and Harvard. The norms of my parents' generation really did seem to be rapidly vanishing. And instead, this was the period where the term career woman jumped into usage. Now, that term has a slightly antiquated feel to it today, and you can kind of see that in that downturn in usage at the end. But when I was a young adult, 
at least in my environment with all of its specifics of class and education and so on, that genuinely did feel like the new normal. Now, having said that, we weren't, you know, we were obviously aware at the time that the old gender norms and gender roles hadn't disappeared overnight. There were many more men than women among my professors. Uh, there were many more men than women in my undergraduate classes and in my PhD classes. And I was certainly aware that past inequities were continuing to cast a long shadow. And indeed, I think that led to my first real involvement in activism for women's causes, which was when in my first job as an assistant professor, a colleague and I advocated very strongly and unsuccessfully for affirmative action hiring for our faculty. And I say unsuccessfully because even though I think my heart was in the right place, my, my grasp of um, academic realpolitik was sorely lacking at that time. And I think all I managed to do was alienate half of my colleagues. But in the bigger scheme of things, that failure actually didn't seem to matter all that much because really all we were trying to do was to speed up what felt like a clear arc of history. And then we became aware of this. And this is where I think the story gets interesting in terms of today's theme. Because if women were hitting a glass ceiling, then the obvious question was why? And the obvious answer was gender bias, which was a term that we also see gaining rapid currency around the same time. So the narrative was simple. The power in business, in society, in academia was still largely held by older men. Many older men were still sexist. These sexist men weren't promoting women. It was a plausible story. It was a simple story. And it was actually a story that still left us some room for optimism, at least if you weren't one of those women actually bumping up against the glass ceiling at the time. Because those old misogynists, they were dinosaurs, they were going to retire and they were going to die and they were going to take their gender bias with them. And they were eventually going to be replaced by, well, the more enlightened men and women of my generation. That seems very naive now. Because what do we see if we look at the 1990s and the 2000s? Well, interestingly, we stopped talking quite so much about gender bias, but we didn't stop talking about the glass ceiling. Instead, we woke up to the fact that the narrative we had to tell and understand wasn't just one of old sexist men. There was something much more insidious. And it was due to a term that's well and truly entered the mainstream in the last decade. It's a term that Quran referred to before, which is unconscious bias. Now look, unconscious bias is really disheartening because it tells us that we're dealing with a problem that is subtle and difficult to identify and difficult to address. Unconscious bias is also really confronting because it tells us that the problem isn't simply the moral, failing, the moral failings of others. It's a cognitive failing that we all possess and by definition we're unaware of. Worse, we may believe that it's a problem for others, but not for ourselves. One study found that 85% of people believe that they are more objective than their average peer. And whenever we have a situation where 85% of the people think they're in the top 50% of the population, you know you've got a problem. And perhaps worst of all, we can fall prey to unconscious bias, even if it's a bias that we are a victim of. The research tells us that victims, individuals who are victims of bias may still internalize those biases. Or well, in the specific context today, women are not immune from biases that negatively affect women. So it's disheartening, it's confronting, but that doesn't mean there's nothing we can do because we can counter these biases to some extent with better policies. Karan alluded to the fact that Melbourne Business School's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, on which I serve, has recently adopted a 34-point action plan for improved gender balance and equity in our faculty. Karan specifically mentioned the accountabilities there, which she does all the time, and that frankly makes me nervous because my name is next to a lot of those accountabilities, but that is really uh, something for which I am personally going to be held, for account, held to account. The plan includes several best practice recommendations for reducing unconscious bias in hiring. So we really do think we are at least making a start on addressing these issues. We can also, of course, encourage women to participate in leadership, something else that Karan and I are continuing to work together on. And then there's unconscious bias training, which, while not a panacea, is certainly something that can help. 
But those are not going to solve all our problems because today is a day when we have to acknowledge what our more nuanced understanding of bias implies. Promoting the success of women in the workplace isn't just a matter of waiting for the dinosaurs to die out. It's not enough just to go through unconscious bias training programs because what matters is the work that we do afterwards. Making ourselves be vigilant and aware of the biases in others, that's one of the easier bits. Continuously inter interrogating our own thought processes so we are aware as best we can be of the biases in ourselves. Being open to criticism from others when they call us out on our own biases. Persuading others to join us on this journey, one of the things that I really have to try and do with my faculty. That's all hard work that lies ahead of every one of us. But look, International Women's Day should be a day for optimism as well. A century ago, in 1922, 26 year old Jean Hare still did not have the vote. Over my lifetime, the shifts in attitudes towards women, more specifically towards women in the workforce, really have been extraordinary. The opportunities the opportunities for women really have radically improved. I don't say that to suggest the problems have been solved. Of course they haven't been. I say that because that's what gives us real cause for belief that if we're willing to do the hard work, we can succeed in keeping on making the world a better place for women. Because that is what's happened over my lifetime. So if we commit and we recommit to the hard work, we can also do that celebrating the change that has already happened, because the technical term for that is progress. Thank you. So I'm going to come in at that point and invite Isabel uh, to take over as our next speaker. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Isabel. Um, thanks, Amanda. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community and pay uh, my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, emerging. I would also like to thank my colleagues for sharing um, the experiences and for raising uh, so many important points which uh, just shows uh, how complex and difficult um, gender equality change is and how difficult it is to change biases. Um, but so let me start by saying on a positive note that the recent snapshot of the Australian population found that 88% of Australians agree that gender equality is a problem. Um, and partly, most of them agree that this is because biases are so difficult to change. We are all prejudiced, prejudiced. and in this particular snapshot, um, the uh, researchers ask also about stereotypes and biases, uh, and women and men equally have uh, biases and act upon them. The stereotypes are very resistance to change because they found them uh, across all generations. So um, Andrew is quite right. It's not a question of uh, the dinosaurs dying out and things will change. That's not going to happen. However, this does not mean that we can't do better. We definitely can. And we have heard a lot of strategies already to reduce gender bias in the workplace, such as you know, the need to increase the presence of women in leadership, to serve as role models, and to counteract those stereotypical beliefs, the need to have crystal clear selection, performance, and promotion criteria to minimize this creeping of subjectivity that it happens so easily and bias uh, in our judgments, and also to hold people accountable, as Andrew said, you know, for their decisions. Research shows that when we do hold people accountable, and if they know they will have to justify their decisions to others, and they are going to be questioned about their decisions, that they uh, make less decisions, and they rely less on stereotypes. But what I would like to focus now is on a rather um, novel strategy, and that is male allyship. Getting leaders and colleagues 
to support gender equality change efforts uh, in business and in academia. Um, men can uh, be gender equality allies, and we know that. Uh, we have mentors, we have sponsors, you know, there, there are experiences in our lives. We just, what I'm going to propose is to broaden uh, that concept. Allyship requires members of the project predominant group to take action to interrupt sexism or gender uh, injustice. And men are really well placed to do this. They are often still the decision makers. We have seen the graphs. Um, as decision makers and leaders, they have the authority to change gender biased practices and they have the resources to provide, you know, to make it happen. Um, but it's not just men in leadership, it's all men. Uh, our peers, they are seen uh, as more credible advocates of gender equality change because they are perceived to have, to, to have no self-interest in such a change. Um, also, men can <coughs> more easily influence other men because they are all part of the same social identity group. Uh, male advocates, therefore, are seen by their male peers, by their colleagues as, as trustworthy sources of information. Um, men also have more social capital and organizational power in, in our society, and they can make a difference. And in fact, research has shown that it costs men less social capital to confront sexism, and men are less likely to receive backlash than women who challenge the same kind of behaviors. So men are really well positioned uh, to be public advocates, but they often aren't. They aren't public, uh, public advocates of gender equality in the, uh, the workplace. Let's look at the statistics. Uh, I'm going to spotlight our audience, 93% are women to in today's audience. So there is a lot that we can do to change this. We know that many men remain silent and away or are passive in this area because they do see gender equality as a women's issue. Um, they also often assume that other men around them support sexism more than they actually do. So they decide not to do anything because they do not want to be in the out group. They don't want to alienate their colleagues. Some men fear being judged by their male peers if they intervene. In fact, men fear being judged by their female peers if they intervene. So, and in the end, some men simply don't get involved because they feel they don't know enough. They don't know what to do or what to say. So what I propose today is that we do make, um, we do have to, to be aware of this and make more of an effort to include male friends, include male colleagues in gender equality conversations so that they are more informed, they are more comfortable being allies in breaking biases in the workplace. Uh, we can do this, that by inviting uh, to our, them to our social gatherings. It seems like such a simple thing to do. Um, and to events such as this webinar. If each one of us had brought one colleague, had convinced one colleague to come and, and listen to this webinar, then we would have had a gender balanced audience. So uh, we can make a huge difference just by you know, the power of one. Because we know that from the social contact hypothesis that uh, exposing people to accurate information, exposing people to other people's experiences, it helps reduce stereotype and prejudice. So in this case, uh, asking men to just come and listen to women's experiences, uh, would help men be more accurate about the interpretation of women's behaviors and their evaluation of women's performance. And even they, they would become more confident in their ability to confront bias when they see it. 
So in sum, a novel approach or a novel strategy, I think, to breaking the bias is to get more men to be gender equality allies in the workplace. Um, so the aim is really to get all those men that in our snapshot of the Australian population agree that gender equality is a problem and believe that in gender equality, to stop being passive and become comfortable being active allies in breaking the bias, both in business and in academia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, and some fantastic suggestions and ideas in both Andrew and Isabel's presentation. So I'm going to ask Danielle uh, just to put up another quick uh, poll around what strategies uh, you think are most important in tackling gender bias, and then we'll move to some of the fantastic questions that we've got. So what in your experience or opinion is the single most important initiative to tackle gender bias? So just um, pop in there what, what on the basis of your experience seems to be most important. And I might invite our other panelists to join me in a moment um, to comment on this. Interesting things coming up. So the, the biggest one here is to develop tailored awareness and education programs for all employees. So uh, I'll give it a moment longer. And Danielle, if you wouldn't mind uh, closing the poll now. So very interesting. Um, <clears throat> the most important factor is that idea of developing more tailored awareness and education programs for all employees. And I'm sure that means uh, the men among us, among us who may be advocates or allies. So um, questions, we've got some wonderful questions in the Q&A. And again, I'm going to invite our panelists in uh, to, to join us here. The first question uh, that I want to ask on behalf of one of our audience is, what are some tips on how to call out bias without it being seen as a personal attack? And um, I'm sure all of our panelists uh, would have had experience with that, men and women. So over to you, what do you think? Calling out bias without it being seen as a personal attack. Have I got some? Amanda, I'm happy to come in there. Um, I think that's probably a skill any leader wants to have, um, whether it's on the topic of bias or, or anything else. Um, and so what I'm going to say in response is, is, is probably just intuitive, um, but often one of the most effective mechanisms for calling something out, something out as undesirable is to point to one's own experience and behavior that might have resembled um, the one you're trying to call out um, and to indicate that um, it's not uncommon that people do this or say these things. And in the context we're talking about, uh, typically unconsciously, uh, so that you you do depersonalize it. But at the same time, I think some of the one of the other strategies there reflects the importance of being able to point to evidence of it, particularly in an academic institution where evidence is highly valued, and pointing to the consequences of that evidence. Um, and being able to draw a link between the evidence and the consequences is very important for, for its legitimacy and acceptance uh, amongst the audience you're trying to persuade. Mm. Um, can I just add to that? There, um, there are some good articles on, on, on that, how to point out bias without, um, you know, suffering uh, less, you know, backlash. And one of them is just to add to Karan's suggestions, which are very good, is to uh, also consider doing it in private if if possible. It can work because then people feel less threatened, they are more likely to be um, uh, more welcoming and, and not defensive. Fantastic. And maybe I can hear from also Andrew or Paul, as a man, you know, Isabel talked about the risks some men feel about um, naming um, bias or discrimination or sexism when it happens. Have you got any thoughts or tips to add? 
Oh, look, only that I would say, Amanda, it, it is really important to, to for women to feel like they've got male um, friends in the room that they can talk to about these issues. So if they don't feel comfortable um, confronting someone, whether it's in private or in public, that they can go to someone that they know that's a trusted advocate on their behalf and say, look, I felt very uncomfortable about that. I think that needs to be called out. I don't feel comfortable doing it, but I'm asking whether you would. And, and I see that as a very, very important part of my my role here as a leader to be able to provide that environment so that people can approach me. And if if I didn't see the issue uh, or, or didn't um, didn't perceive it uh, because of my own biases, then I can act on that on their behalf. And I think that's the sort of support that um, Isabel, I think, was referring to that that um, male champions here should be should be playing. And so I, I would strongly encourage people to do that, um, um, particularly in instances where they felt there might be a backlash against them if they were to call it out. Now, over and above that, I think as Karan points out, there's a wonderful set of skills you can have to kind of make something very clear without attacking people. And I always try and say, you know, I just need to check in with you. Are you, are you clear on how that made other people feel in the room? Uh, and, and ask them that question so that it's then not an attack per se, but it's getting them to see if they have the ability to reflect on their own behaviour and how it's and the empathy required to, to see how it might have affected others. And I have to say, sometimes they don't. <laughs> That's not a big surprise that self-awareness and empathy and things like that uh, are part of the problem here we need to address. And so if that if that softly softly approach doesn't work, then I think it does need a firmer hand. And and again, you need senior leaders, male or female, in the room to help navigate that um, that course. Mm. So thanks all. Um, time for one uh, more question, I think. And Paul, there was a lot of response to, you know, your efforts to uh, really change the culture of the BCom. There was one question which was, um, and there was a lot of support for taking that back into schools and, and how we build that pipeline into com commerce and economics. But there was a question about, does it, uh, and this is from John, is there ways of adding or changing the uh, curriculum that might make it also more attractive to women? Just wondering if you've got some comments on that. Yeah, look, and I did respond to John in the, the chat room, um, but but I'm um, happy to, to have a chat about that. And I think I have to be uh, upfront here and say I don't know the answers to that, but what I hear from my female faculty um, members uh, many of whom have have um, high school have have female kids who are going through high school themselves and reflecting on some of the issues about oh they'd like to go into business maybe but they don't see it as a long term safe supportive and satisfying um, domain for them so you know that's the long term big picture but the the sort of narrower scope of that is what is it that's in the curriculum that's not appealing to them and i think you know there is a sense in which it can be perceived as a, as a bit of a training ground for male investment bankers um, and, you know, we need to do more to disavow um, ourselves of that. That's not what we're here for. And I am trying hard in the, in the BCom to, to completely revamp the way we think about our focus on sustainability, on ethics and on responsibility, um, because they're the characteristics of female leaders and females in general that, that I think can be harnessed and, and focused into the curriculum more. Um, we haven't done a great job at that. We are a little bit behind the eight ball in the BCom anyway. I, I can't speak on behalf of, of the MBA or other, other programs that we offer, but we are behind other institutions uh, and other institutions that seem to be doing quite well with regard to female participation rates in their business degrees, not commerce, but business undergraduate degrees. Uh, and perhaps that's an important part of, 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 the, of the, um, the solution here. Great, thank you very much, Paul. And it, it goes to one more question that I'll just allude to, which was, um, you know, perhaps the Australian business culture is part of the problem. And, and what you're talking about there, Paul, is the way in which, um, you know, some individuals, some leaders behave in our, our business culture and our efforts to sort of shift that culture. So their questions for, for you in the BCom and certainly for us in the business school. So uh, in the interest of, of a timely finish, uh, I'm, I'm going to move to thanks now. 
I want to thank our audience, our fantastic audience. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your interest in the topic. Uh, it's great to have so many of you join us today. Uh, thank you to our panelists, um, Karan, Paul, Andrew and Isabel, some really um, diverse ideas about how we can do this better. Uh, I also love the fact that, uh, you know, starting from, um, from not doing it very well, uh, you know, we really need to acknowledge where there's a lot of room for change and where we need to do things better. It's a fantastic place to start. So just before we finish, um, you will get a recording um, of today's session as an email if you've registered for the session. So please enjoy that uh, and share it with whoever you'd like. And I would like to mention that we have another breakfast coming up uh, that you may very well be interested in. Uh, it's on the 15th of March, a breakfast with Sean Armistead, hosted by the Dylan Dewar Centre for Indigenous Business Leadership. So. Um, Happy Women's, Women's Day, International Women's Day, everyone. Have a great day. Celebrate women. Celebrate all of the women you know, the ones around you, uh, and support women. Over to you, and goodbye. <laughs>